If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Hey, so what a, what a fun episode. Our boy Chase, right? We were on his show mm. uh, about a month or so ago. Maybe Ever month. Forward Podcast. Great yeah. dude. Yes. Really, really like that guy. Really this good. podcast gets pretty deep, man. Yeah. It gets pretty deep. We talk about PTSD. We talk about, um, I mean- there were a few moments there was uncomfortable having these conversations because it got so it got so good it got so deep. Mm. You guys will enjoy it. Uh, Chase Tuning um, has a long history in the military. He's got a great podcast called Ever Forward. Um, him, him and Adam have quite a bit in common. You wouldn't think so uh, first glance, but we had a good conversation and it started getting pretty good. Yeah, it got pretty deep. But uh, I really like the message that he has. Right, the message that he has and what he's doing. He's got a cool story. Yeah. Um. And he and he's one of my like as far as like podcasters who's interviewed us. I think his flow of the podcast he does a good was, job. Yeah, like he's a really good interviewer. So we've talked about we've highlighted a few guys that have interviewed us and girls that have interviewed us before that. I think are really, really good at interviewing. Mm-hmm. I think he does a great job. He's one of those guys I have no doubt his podcast can continue to grow and do well. So I'm glad. For sure. Good message, good podcast. Yeah, glad so. we connected yeah. earlier. His on. podcast, Ever Forward Podcast. His website is Chase Tuning. That's C H E W N I N G dot com. Uh, his website is everforwardapparel.com. And you can find him on uh, Instagram at Tuning. Elder? The, the Elder. The Elder. Sorry, yeah. Tuning the Elder. So without any further ado, here we are talking to the host of Ever Forward Podcast, Chase Tuning. So I was asking you earlier, your podcast has been on air since January? Yeah, so I launched January 22nd of this year, and uh, here we are, December. So damn, I can't believe it's already been a year, just about, pretty much, yeah. Wow, is it now, is that all you do now? Is that your thing, or, or is it so, part of a bigger picture? Well, I continue to be vain and try to wear my headphones and not mess up my hair. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the podcast is definitely my baby. That's my, my my biggest focus all of this year. Actually started like summer last year when I got the concept of it and then just decided to start interviewing people and push forward. So this year has been the podcast and then I do dabble. We're talking about in YouTube a little bit. And uh, as of late, starting October, I launched a private coaching business. So it's what I do full time as a job. But uh, I just kind of segued out. With that, and we've got Everford Radio, Everford Apparel, and now Everford Coach. Now, what made you go in this direction? I know you you served before, right? Yes, yes. I did six years active duty in the Army. I enlisted right out of high school. And honestly, that, that whole time, that period right there, was what got me started in you know the quote fitness industry. Hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. Getting started in the military? Uh, yeah. So, so were you were you so you weren't fit or working out or anything like that until you got into what, basic training? Uh, well, I mean, I was active my whole life. We had, um, you know, I grew up down in the woods, like in the country, and way southwest Virginia. So we had like 200 acres. Me, my brother, my sister, we would just run wild, play down in the creek, build forts every day, and uh, you know, just go from there. And so I played baseball, sports growing up, and then once I went into the military. It's a pretty fucking active job, right? It's probably the most active job in the world. And I wound up getting injured, wound up getting medically discharged, and then in that process of wanting, needing to really relearn the human body in a different way, you know, versus just being active because this is what I can do, but really truly understanding anatomy, physiology, Mm. exercise science, nutrition, because I was a different person in a different place. And so I just kind of fell in love with it from there. How did you go about finding that information? Like, where did you go? So besides the interwebs and finding all the misinformation out there and kind of just getting my feet wet with a lot of bro science, I went into an exercise science program. So hmm. self-discovery, self-learning, the internet, and then went to uh, went to school. Yeah, got my undergraduate exercise science, took about a year off in between some jobs and stuff, and then went into my master's program, health promotion. Anytime I meet somebody who served uh, in the military for that, for any length of period of time. It's always fascinating to me because I've never done, I never, I didn't serve, neither, none of us have. And it's- You serve in different ways. It's, yeah, okay. But it's, but it's different though, right? I mean, you go in, it's totally different from regular civilian life. Yeah. How did it change you? How did it shape you? What were your challenges? What's it like? Man, in which way didn't it change me? Uh, it's, Did you know um, that going into it? Like, were you, because I, I, I almost went. I remember thinking, oh, yeah? like, and I yeah. remember what my buddy and I, we were debating in. It was like, I need this. I need direction in my life. Like, this is going to help me find that. I, that's why I almost did. I think a lot of people go that go that route. They're like, you know, I, I'm lost. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And, you know, this gives me 
roof over my head, a paycheck, and, you know, sends me to cool places over the world. So for me, it was just kind of, I didn't really know what the hell I wanted to do when I grew up. I had some idea of what I wanted to pursue and study in college. Uh, the, but I think the big thing that was kind of like the 51% leaning over the fence for me was this idea of legacy. And it was something that my dad did, my grandfather, my uncle. Mm -hmm. We go way, way back all the way to like Civil War and even, I think even, damn, the uh, like American Revolution. Oh, wow. Shit. Yeah, we've got like tunings way, Long way, way back in like Arlington National Cemetery. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that really appealed to me. And I was like, well, if that seems pretty cool right now <laughs> versus not really knowing what I wanted to do in school, I was just like, I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste my money. So, yeah, I enlisted actually Christmas break of my senior year of high school. And then uh, about six months later, shipped off to basic training. And uh, yeah. Was it what you thought it would be? Yes. I, again, I kind of had like an insight. So mm -hmm. my dad was like, you know, he went to military school. He went to the army. And, you know, my decision to go in was never forced. It was never like, hey, this is what our family does. So you're going to fucking do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just kind of like, hey, choose the best path for you. Whatever you do, you know, we'll, oh, we'll support. Cool. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of had an idea of what I was going into from the beginning, which I think gave me a leg up especially in boot camp, my dad definitely was like training me before I went in kind of thing, you know, physically and mentally. But uh, even still, even knowing what I wanted to do somewhat and even knowing what this world was going to kind of look like, it totally, totally transformed my life. At what point did it change? Hmm. Did you change your mind that you weren't going to just continue to serve and actually move up the rankings in the army? Like what made you go like, okay, I'm good. It was kind of decided for me. So about four and a half years in, you know, we were talking earlier, I speak Russian. That was my job in the army. I signed up to go into the Intel field. Oh, that's an easy language. Oh, totally. It's the easiest thing in the world. I can teach you here when we're done. No problem. Yeah. Cool. And, da. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, you go through a series of tests and applications before you choose any job in the military and somehow I made it through this process the hardest the hardest test I've ever taken in my life this thing's called uh, the D-Lab the Defense Language Aptitude Battery Test and it's literally like a two hour exam of just made up noises and characters and just weird 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 puzzles and based upon how you score there if you even pass they categorize you into a language so for whatever oh, reason, what? that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So like if you're more of an auditory listener, they'll put you hmm. in whatever language or if you you do really well with like puzzles and looking at pictures, they'll give you like a character language like Japanese or Chinese or something. That's like fascinating. That. That's that brilliant. Really yeah. Interesting. So your test said Russian. My, my test said, da, send them, <laughs> send them to, uh, send them to Russian. You know, the, the whole language academy is in one place, uh, the D DLI right here in Monterey. So, you know, I used to live right down the road from you guys pretty much. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I went and did that. Um, and, uh, Shit, what was it? Originally? I asked you like, what, why, or at what point did you go like, oh, I'm good, and you yeah. want to just keep moving up the ranks? Uh -oh. So I did. You know, I went in. I was like, hell, I'm 17. You can do 20 years, retire 37, pretty cool, and then go off to your next phase of life, whatever. Um, so about four, four and a half years in, I was really enjoying the Russian thing, sort of, kind of, not really, uh, and I wanted to kind of flex my soldier muscles a little bit. You know, we all go through the same training. A soldier is a soldier is a soldier, but y'all have different jobs, and so. I kind of want to take a break from the from the Russian stuff. I want to go see what it's like to every day just live the soldier life and, you know, be the guy over there, as we call it. And so I volunteered, tried to volunteer for a couple of deployments. Uh, the first one didn't work out. I wasn't the right rank. So I did the work, did my studying, went to promotion boards, made my way up the ranks. Uh, actually, I wound up separating as an E6, a staff sergeant. Uh, I made E6 in just under five years. And anyone listening who's in the military Doing that's really hard. And so I worked my ass off because I really wanted to, you know, go. What does that entail? Thing. What is like? So basically in E6 is you would be like a, a general manager. Uh, so basically you would be overseeing either uh, your, your whole squad or whole platoon, depending upon wh what your unit looks like. So at a minimum, you'd be looking at about seven to 12 guys that you'd be directly be responsible for. Uh, and then if you're a, a platoon leader, you would directly be responsible for anywhere between like 35 to maybe even 60. Oh, I see. So you, you quickly get put into leadership roles, um, managerial roles. And so did that, started making my way up through the ranks and doing all the necessary steps so that I could go be this idea, this form of a soldier that I thought I wanted to be. And in that process, you have to go through like war game training. So... We're out in the field for a few days, and I wound up, uh, I was leading my group against what we call the opposing force, the op four, the the fake enemy, so to speak, and just snapped my shit up, man. I, uh, what did you do? So it wasn't even like he anything heavy impact. I was just leading a group. I just moved too fast in the wrong direction, just all things wrong. And I wound up, I tore my hamstring, uh, really, really injured, kind of just like really heavily twisted and 
I didn't break my back, but just my L4 and L5 just went the wrong way. And uh, from there, just trying to go through the rehab too fast, trying to get put, put back on the duty roster too soon, wound up re-injuring myself over and over, turned into bigger problems with my hips. And so long story short, I wound up having to have both my hips completely reconstructed. So they yanked me entirely from that mission, that roster. I got put in a med hold unit and I was a patient. My last year and a half in the military, they would just cut me open. They re reconstructed my femurs, shaved it down, put two pins in, sew me back up, teach me how to walk again. I could walk, go back, do the other side. So for like a year and a half, I was just a patient, man. Holy and, yeah. shit, that's that yeah, sounds that's extremely challenging. Oh, it sucked. Right. It sucked. Talk about <laughs> so, so Were you depressed yeah. through that process? <laughs> Good question. I, I, no, I mean, not really. I mean, in a sense of um, kind of realizing that this idea of me serving for 20 years, me being soldier chase, was totally gone, totally out the window. But I guess because I didn't go into it so die hard that this is what I want to do and the only thing I want to do with my life, it kind of made it easier to start to separate. Um, so yeah, I, uh, went through that first process and then just a lot of rehab, a lot of downtime and just began to kind of think about, okay, well, what's next? It's, what's it's next? easy to, uh, not easy, but it's easier to imagine and picture the physical challenges with doing that over the course of a year. Obviously, you know, the, the surgeries, the pain, the re the rehab, all that stuff. What's harder, I think, for people to understand when someone goes through something like that are the mental challenges yeah. that you go through go what was that like for you so like i was saying earlier i always knew what it was like to just get up and go and be active and that really i think kind of gave me a lot of mental wellness clarity whatever you want to call it because you know the mind feeds the body and the body feeds the mind i think and so in that sense my mind wasn't able to do anything because my body couldn't <laughs> do anything and so it um i mean it's it kind of sounds kind of cliche, but I kind of just always had a really good attitude about it. I mean, I, I think I immediately knew it what built was your different. character. It sounds like yeah, very you much so. You weren't someone who folded over it yeah. or it, it, you know depressed about it. You fucking yeah. rise. Yeah, rise. what kept you strong? I had to be. Uh, well, well a leadership, your leadership role, right? I mean, yeah. That, to, I think, to me, I want to know that I love hearing somebody who's uh, was in a leadership role at that young of an age. What are some of the things that you learned going through that process? Because that's got to be challenging in your te late teens, oh, early twenties. Yeah, I was like 20, 21 at this time. Leading yeah. people, right? Yeah, it's weird. You're like uh, you're the, you're a kid. You're literally a kid, and you're in charge of other people's lives. Right. Uh, maybe not directly, but you know, hey, if we don't properly do this mission or properly train, you know, this could affect the lives of other people downrange. Or what we do now, you could fuck up later, and mm -hmm. it's going to cost your life, or possibly even worse, someone to the left and right of you. So, I think already having that instilled in me that it wasn't about me knowing that this isn't just my mission to just abandon, you know, being a soldier or having this job or whatever, because they do such an amazing job of getting rid of the I and incorporating the we, you know, they ditch the ego right out of the door, right? The first day of basic training. So I already kind of knew that, you know, I had this bigger mission to serve and it wasn't about me. And at that time, this kind of mm -hmm. ties into uh, with the whole Ever Forward thing, you know, I had just lost my dad. And so I was just really driven from the familial aspect of not wanting to, not wanting to let my family down. You know, I wanted to continue, continue to serve. I wanted to, because it was such a big thing to him. He, uh, was this while you were going through rehab and stuff that your father Shortly, passed? yeah. He passed away in 05. My first surgery was like uh, mid, late 07. Oh. Um, so, so it's like, boom, boom, one yeah, thing after another. Yeah. Yeah. Big life change, big life change. And so uh, I've always been kind of driven by the, the greater good, the bigger mission. And so I think that, you know, in a way really helped. Um, and so I don't, it might've been easier for me just to say, screw it and walk away if I didn't really have uh, his legacy, his honor that I wanted to kind of continue down the line. If I didn't have, you know, if I wasn't the oldest brother, if I wasn't all these things that I thought it was supposed to be, I mean, who knows, it might've totally changed my outlook on everything. And that's where the name Ever Forward came from? Was it through these experiences? Yeah. Yeah. Ever Forward. So that was really where I first began to kind of learn what it was like to live, you know, what we say, you know, live a life Ever Forward. And uh, it was something actually that started in the military. My dad, he was in the army, like I said, his first unit, like every unit you go to, we all have a creed, a saying, and his first unit was Ever Forward. And so he picked it up from his time in That's the army. Cool. He carried it on. Yeah, exactly. So he brought it home with him, literally. And uh, he instilled it in us growing up. And we just kind of just heard our dad say this thing growing up. They didn't really pay much attention to it. But uh, once he got sick, he was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, 
literally about two, if not three weeks after I left for boot camp. So I started my whole life transition and my life transitioned in a whole other way back home. And so I actually wanted to get out. I dropped paperwork. You can, if you can prove you have a family hardship in the military, mm -hmm. uh, that your presence is needed more at home, they'll cut your contract. They'll let you go. And I actually started to do that. But then once my dad found out, he was like, hell no. He flew out to California. I was stationed Monterey at the time uh, while he could still move and still talk and spent literally four days with me on base in hotels, just literally telling me why I should not stop because of him. Mm. Sh teaching me and showing me what it was like to live a life ever forward, what it really, really meant. And so I think those four days, that conversation, um, to really kind of go back to your question, was just uh, what I kept latching onto of why I wanted to keep pushing forward and why I didn't want to just stay on the couch and just, you know, say F my life <laughs> and, you know, just let these injuries and let this setback get the better of me. He wow. sounded like a pretty awesome guy. My dad? Yeah. He was the coolest, man. He was he was my best friend. He was my mentor. You know, before I even knew what it was, he was he was my sergeant. <laughs> he was the guy, you know, that uh, I went to for answers and, you know, gave me questions and answers when both were needed. And uh, I, I would, I, I still speak the, the the highest of him. And he just literally instilled in me and my whole family what, um, what we should be and what honor and integrity and selfless service and all these things that I picked up in the military for sure that kind of really sharpened that skill set but it all started with him man any mistakes like that you remember being in leadership role at that young of an age you remember like fuck i should have done that or i think one of the biggest mistakes being out now and especially in the military that leaders make uh, even just being a manager i don't think you're necessarily a leader but uh just thinking that you're a leader so like i'm in this leadership position so therefore what i say is right mm. and so many times man i was wrong so many times I would see that so many times with other people that maybe were the same rank or above me. And we, we would call it, you know, they just hide behind their rank and, you know, everyone walks around with their rank on their chest. And, uh, I could just look at people and know that you don't fucking deserve to wear that. Mm -hmm. You know, you are literally just, you just because you maybe joined six months ahead of me or went to the promotion board a month ahead of me, like you have this rank, but you don't deserve it. You're mm -hmm. just in this position. You're not telling me how to be a better person, how to be a better soldier. You're just telling me because you can tell me. How common is it? I know in real yeah. life, that's very common. We talk about this. I used to talk about this all the time with other managers and peers that I worked yeah. with. Just like very small percentage, I believe, really should be in that leadership role. Is it like that with even when you serve too? Is it? Absolutely. Uh, I will say it. I think that uh, I was blessed and fortunate enough to have some amazing leaders, some guys that... Mm -hmm. um, for all intents and purposes, probably crossed the boundary of, you know, what we call fraternization. You know, hey, you're really high up. I'm not quite there, so we shouldn't be having this conversation kind of thing. But, you know, I think the guys who recognize that there's a connection, there's a way to instill something of worth in another person, they'll, you know, I, I'll never forget I had this one first sergeant. Uh, first sergeant's like the top, basically. You know, I was at E6 there in E7 acting sometimes can mean E8. So, like, years in ranks in between mm -hmm. us. Um, and this guy, every time he would just like want to call bullshit or even cut the bullshit, he would just rip off his rank off his uniform, throw it down on the desk and be like, you're a human being. I'm a human being. Here's where I'm messing up. Here's where you're messing up and just, you know, shoot it to your raw, man. Yeah. That's that, that seems so uncommon, right? Especially in that environment. Like it and, is. Yeah. Cause it is. you have, you earn those ranks, right? Exactly. And so now yeah. it's like, I'm, you know, I'm in this authoritative position. So, I mean, was that, that was uncommon then, it right? So uncommon. Part? Yeah. So uncommon. Because I think a lot of people will take a lot of pride in the fact that, you know, there are certain rank, which in some instances, you deserve it. Yeah, you work your ass out for it. Like I said, you know, I made E6 in less than five years, and that's really hard to do. So a lot of times people just get caught up in your accomplishments hmm. and not really what that means. Like it's not, you don't have an extra chevron or an extra shiny thing on your chest mm -hmm. that just means you're better than everybody. Like this is a great power. This also has a great responsibility. Leadership is 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 an earned once, it's always earned. Yes, you're not going to get people to follow you if you stop leading. It's just the, it's just the way it is. I think people forget that. Yeah, I've worked for managers like that where they maybe at one point were doing great things as leaders and then they just stopped, <clears throat> and it, you know they lose the respect of the people underneath them. And and when you lose their respect, you're no no longer effective as a leader. Yeah. What is your, uh, with your podcast, with what you're doing now, what is your larger purpose? Like what's driving you behind, you know, behind all this? I mean, obviously, you know, to live a life ever forward has, for lack of a better term, kind of become like a, a, a catchphrase. You know, it, we, it went from just ever forward, you know, and now that 
I have to put it into words <laughs> in a podcast. It's it's not just you know a cool T shirt or whatever, but um, it, tur- it has turned into an act. It has turned into a service, and so I think being able to just talk about it is one thing, but then also to be able to to live it and you know push forward with my dreams and aspirations and share those and also share the setbacks and the failures and the, and the rough spots. Um, and just having that brutal honesty, that's what, that's what Everford is all about, you know, and my brother does it with the apparel line so that people can literally walk around and share it. And then with the podcast and the coaching, it's just, um, it's all encompassing. So we have different avenues of this business and this brand, but it all comes under the same umbrella, the same two words. Let's talk about what that's like to start a podcast and build a business like you are right now. I mean, you're you're fresh in it right now. And yeah, we have a lot of people yeah. that are listening that actually either one, want to start a podcast or mm-hmm. want to build a coaching business. What are some of the things that you've learned in this past year? The more you know, the more you don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, you never stop learning. And the second you think you've mastered something, you're wrong. Just stop, take it take a step back and figure out where your ego is getting in the way. Um, it's just also, I mean, delegation, huge for sure. I mean, I think any entrepreneur listening right now, you guys I'm sure can relate is you want to just make sure everything succeeds so quickly and so well that you just try to be involved with everything. You Wouldn't to, you say that's one of the hardest things for a lot of leader God, leadership type personalities yeah, to deal yeah. with? You're such a giving things up, right? Exactly. Ugh. It, there's a difference, you know, I think in, in giving things up and, you know, entrusting things yeah. with other people. Absolutely. But, you know, it's hard. We don't always recognize that. It always just initially seems like, <laughs> I got to give this up or like, I'm not going to know this is done right. But, you know, that's where trusting and having the right people uh, surrounding you and part of that journey, I think, can be even better because they're going to have an insight and objective perspective that you probably don't have. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, definitely you're not always the smartest person in the room. Just always remember that for sure. Who are, you, when you, who are you talking to when you're doing your podcast? In other words, are you thinking to yourself like this is, you know, like sometimes when I'm talking on the podcast, I'm thinking of young kid who's, you know, just getting into fitness, you know, kind of like I was, who's got the wrong information, who maybe have, uh, you know, insecurities about their bodies. And I'm trying to talk to that person. Or sometimes I feel like I'm talking to, you know, the soccer mom who's, super stressed out and, you know, just wants to feel better or are there, is there someone in particular or a group of people in particular you feel like you're talking to? Yeah. Sometimes I talk to soccer moms and then my wife yells at me, but that's usually just when I go to store. Like, hey girl. Uh, yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> talking to you. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I think I'm probably talking to my former self because. Who is that? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. Um, someone who. Someone who's a little bit lost, but a little bit thinks they're on the right path. You know, they they're pursuing something that either they they think they should be doing, but also partially is something they want to be doing. Um, but you're not quite sure. You're not quite you know sipping the Kool Aid wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know that going down this direction is better than taking no direction. You know, taking a step is better than taking no step. Uh, and particularly with you know my story and my podcast, you know, we're in the fitness and nutrition and self-help and health categories. So I have to always kind of keep that in mind. And I always think it comes back to, to your health. And so to me, that means a lot of different things. And so me talking to myself, imagining me as my own avatar kind of thing is that this is someone who recognizes that I need to be taking care of myself. And that means physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, all the above. Uh, and I can say that wholeheartedly now, back then, I, I was just like, I need to go, I need to go to a gym, need to lift weights, need to look cool, mm-hmm. right? Kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, and my efforts are to bring about all of these nutrition and fitness and mindset guests and topics so that my former self and anyone else listening right now can pick up on what's intriguing and appealing to them right now, but also kind of something kind of shiny or intriguing mm-hmm. can, can lure them into another aspect that maybe they're neglecting. Uh, and I neglected a lot of areas in my life. Hmm. performer self avatar for sure what's one of the most impactful things you've learned as far as what you were doing fitness wise versus then now what you're expressing like something that you could have changed and told yourself going through that process that it's okay to to do what you want not because everyone else is doing it um i think when i first started really get into what we all consider now the fitness industry is just like you just go to gym lift weights get jacked get shredded whatever um, because it's cool and hot and sexy, but uh, I mean, everybody is different, literally everybody. And so I think uh, 
Sal, it's you who says it, right? The your body is always going to be your best coach. Mm-hmm. I, I think I picked up on that recently. Yeah. Um, people need to remember that, and so find a cool program that you like, or find a good gym buddy, uh, or find a good gym, or find a open space in your basement, whatever, um, and just listen to your body. Mm-hmm. Try stuff out. If your body likes lifting weights, cool. If your body likes doing body weight stuff, if your body likes taking a walk with your dog, your family, if your body likes doing meditation, you know, whatever, your body will tell you what it likes, what it doesn't like, what it needs, and what it doesn't. It's so hard to listen. People don't know how to listen to their body. How long did it take you to learn to do that? 10, 12 years. Yeah, at least a decade. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, the military almost teaches you probably not to, though, right? Don't they teach you, like, you power like, through everything? Yeah. Oh, because, hell yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Like the yeah, opposite. Exactly. You know, it teaches you, hey, show up, be on time, be in the right uniform, and run like hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mental discipline exactly, on yeah. point. Yeah. Exactly. You know, drive on. The mission is priority. And, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, that takes priority. You have to accomplish that. And in order to accomplish that mission, your body has to be in the most incredible shape possible. You have to have peak performance high endurance, you just have to be able to throw your ruck on, you know, carry a body, you know, fire your weapon, whatever. Uh, so it's definitely, I would say definitely mindset and physical performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely some merit and benefit to being able to sometimes, I hate to say it, not listen to your body or yeah. get your, or push yourself to limits that you did not think were possible. And uh, I think, mm-hmm. you know- Setting new standards. Yeah, yeah. Mili- military training- I mean, they're excellent at this. I mean, they have to be. Obviously, the goal is to turn people into effective uh, soldiers uh, and effective at their job. And it's the it could be the what determines whether or not you you live or die. Yeah. In a particular situation, if you're in freezing cold temperature, wet, starving, and you've got the enemy coming after yeah. you, you don't want to listen to your body because your body's telling you to you know hey go get it's some easy. food and relax yeah. or give up and you can't you got to keep so That must be a conflicting message for you in your brain right because you've been trained that way for so long but then you also Or do they work together? I think um you know it, honestly I would probably have to separate the two. I mean if I'm in that environment when I was soldier chase versus when I'm just chase chase now it, it's you have to you have to kind of have that switch in the military. You have to prioritize mission 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 and just, you know, tell your body no sometimes. But, you know, now it definitely took a while to kind of learn that separation, to learn when, yeah, I can push myself forward, I can push myself more because it's just my fear or the uncomfortableness of it that is kind of holding me back, not the actual lack of ability or technical skill to Ooh, do whatever's That's a tough one to learn. Yeah, yeah. And so I think um, anyone listening, you know, in the military, yeah, that for sure, you know, takes precedent sometimes. And sometimes is it is it wrong? Yeah. You know, and that's definitely how I wound up re-injuring myself and getting myself pulled off that roster, cutting myself open, you know, and, you know, kind of set me down a different path. You know, it's in, it's, this is a great topic because I think a lot of times people can look at or we tend to look at situations and decide that was a good thing, that was a bad thing. And on the surface, your injury, your re-injury, the rehab process sounds terrible. However, uh, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing or would yeah. you wouldn't be this person now. Yeah. Do you, do you view it as a gift or does it seem like, man, have you guys been stalking me? No, <laughs> it's uh maybe <laughs> definitely online. Just, uh, just soccer moms, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's really funny. And, and again, this just goes to show that uh, I don't know if I would quite say, I believe, you know, I, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens. And it's up to us to put reason to it, hmm. to really learn from Great it. Great way to put it. Um, I would love to take credit for that. I think either my coach or someone I was just talked to recently mentioned that to me. I, think, not, I, I think I said it first. Actually, <laughs> I take it back. If we could edit <laughs> that out. Of our uh, Chase Tuning, uh, copyright 2017. Uh, <laughs> um, I, that's one of the biggest things that I've been going through lately. And I think there's been this next evolution in myself that has definitely transferred into the next evolution of whatever Ford is as a brand, as a business, as a podcast, as you know, whatever. And that it is finding the most painful, difficult gifts in every situation. Um, I'm, just, I'm doing a Vlogmas series right now. Have you guys ever heard of Vlogmas? You basically 25 days of Christmas leading up. 
you do a video every day for YouTube. Uh, and Vlogmas? Yeah, Vlogmas, yeah. And I thoroughly regret it. It's so painstaking. But, <laughs> oh, dude, you, know, you are committed. Sounds, it's, it's sounds a challenge. Sounds awesome. It's yeah. a, no, it's totally right. <laughs> Do you have a song for it? Vlogmas. No, you should. Uh, can you write me one real quick? Yeah, I'll, I'll work on it. Yeah, I'll work on it. Um, but one of the videos I put up the other day was... I was just like looking for, I was like, man, what am I going to talk about? And so I was in my car, like I always am, because I'm always fucking traveling somewhere. And uh, I keep my dad's dog tags hanging from the rear view mirror. Mm. And uh, I was like, boom, there I go. So one of the biggest things that I've kept hidden from myself and my audience is that uh, I, I'm not this just like always happy-go-lucky, optimistic guy who just so easy to say live a life ever forward because – um, my dad, God bless his soul, gave us this cool phrase that we've turned into a cool thing. You know, um, I I've shared with maybe about two other people my entire life the dark origin of what Everford means to me. Um, and honestly, really going back to when my dad was visiting for four days, you know, what also kind of like saved my life. Um, the gift that I learned was that my dad had to die. My dad had to teach us this lesson. My dad had to share with us this, this value, this honor, this legacy of what we can do now. Uh, and it wouldn't have happened any other way. And his passing, and I wish it, of course, didn't happen in, in a less painful way. But the gift that I got out of that was this, this lesson learned of giving my life meaning and hmm. what it's like to live it, walk it, talk it, breathe it, and share it with others. And so what I talked about in this video was that, um, you know, I, the reason why I was in that place, while I was in that training incident where I wound up getting injured that has set me down this path now is because I volunteered, I was trying to volunteer to be deployed because I did not want to come back alive. Mm. I wanted to die the honorable death. I wanted to, you know, be what I thought was this honor, soldier, glory in the battlefield kind of thing because I just lost my dad. I just lost my best friend. God, when did you recognize wow. that? I knew what I was doing. I, I would say like in the back of my head, I was kind of like, like this, this dark passenger, to, you know, Dexter shout out this dark passenger kind of just like mm. showing me the, this alluring, easy way out that, you know, Hey, Chase, like your life sucks right now. Seemingly you're, you're going through a lot of hard shit right now. This would be an easy way out. And then at the time, like the military just upped our life insurance plan from, Two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. I was like, "Wow, if I didn't come back, you know, my family would be taken care of financially." And so, I saw this easy way out of all my problems, and that was why I really, mm. wholeheartedly, now looking back, decided to pursue that option. And uh, it wasn't meant to be. I, you know, tried twice. The first time, apparently, wasn't listening. The second time, I had to snap my shit up <laughs> to, you know, to learn that lesson and to be yanked from that path. But. Um, I made this video about talking about that and what it was like to really battle the idea of your own mortality and looking at life or death. And I'm not someone who I would never take my own life. That's just not who I am. But I, I recognize that I didn't really care. Well, in a sense, in back. a sense, you kind of almost did. Yeah, right. I guess so, yeah, I mean, you weren't maybe you weren't thinking I was going to pull the trigger myself. But I mean, you were putting you were trying to put yourself in harm's way. If someone else did. It wouldn't have bothered me. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I thought I was doing the right thing. At the same time, taking the easy way out from all this pain and suffering that I was going through mm -hmm. that I was just too afraid to just take on. And, and what I'm looking at now is looking at that gift, looking at all the pain and the suffering mentally, emotionally, physically that I had to go through in those couple years of losing my dad, being apart from my family, being a patient for a year and a half, learning how to walk again twice and like having my entire life plan pretty much scrubbed and having to start over. And, you know, it took 10 years before I could ever talk about my dad or be in a hospital or hell, even watch an episode of like Grey's Anatomy without completely breaking down. Yeah. Um, I always make this, this joke, uh, I just never joke about mental health, but um, I'm the only guy, one of the only guys that I know that went through <laughs> six years of active duty to walk out with uh, PTSD and a mild TBI while never actually being downrange. Hmm. You know, you know, I have diagnosed mild PTSD from the horrific scenes and things that I went through with my dad. And I went through years of on and off years of therapy and working with someone. And, and then on my own in the gym, working out those physical demons uh, to just try to run away and wound up being on narcotic pain medication for months and months and months because of my surgeries wound up giving myself a concussion because I was loopy as hell, fell over, knocked my head out or knocked my 
self-unconscious, gave myself a mild TBI. And, you know, all these things set me down the path that I'm on now. And it took me 10, damn, 10 years to really look at this as, as a gift, to know that, hey, Chase, if you didn't go through all this shit, you wouldn't understand what you're talking about now. Mm-hmm. You know, I could just have a cool phrase ever forward and seem like this guy who's got his shit together. Right. But, you know, now I recognize that it was because of those dark times, it was because of getting comfortable with the uncomfortable that I can speak it, live it. Let's it, talk it. about some of those monsters because you just named, I'm going to back you up. You just named yeah. something that I dealt with before. And in my opinion, it was one of the hardest things I ever dealt with, which was I got addicted to painkillers mm-hmm. when I went through my ACL MCL. So did you actually get addicted to the pills? At the time, I didn't recognize it was an addiction. Right. Looking back, 100%. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So what was that? Tell me about that whole process and then coming off because that's a motherfucker. Dude, so unreal. Like I can 100% clearly understand where people are talking about, oh, I had no idea. Uh, I'm not an addict, but you know, I just need another pill. It's so easy, especially when you can legitimize it in your own head as far as like, I'm right, going yeah, to surgery. Injury, right? yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And you know, after my second surgery, I semi re-injured um, my hip. I moved too quickly, like two weeks after the surgery and uh, sent myself back to the hospital. So I was on like pill form morphine. I was on every narcotic, every pain med. You What's the imagine. highest you got up to? Uh, I was on Dilaudid, like hydromorphone. Okay. Like daily, wow. multiple times a day for about, up to about three, four months. Now, did you scale up that? Did you start with Vicodin or oh, Somas yeah, yeah. or Percocets? And then you, that it was all the enough. gateway. Talk about that. People don't, stuff, people yeah. don't like, uh, I remember it's so much more common than, than it, is, it is. It's very common. It's, uh, it's the elephant in the room that nobody likes to talk about because it's prescribed all over the world. It's widely accepted because it's we have doctor int- candy, right? Mm-hmm. So talk to, talk to me about, uh, what that was like, uh, how you started to scale up. Cause I, I went from somebody having, this is kind of, I'll give you the short version of my story is, you know, tore my ACL, MCL. Doctor prescribes me my, uh, Norco's. I start taking them uh, on the pill bottle. It says take every four hours, so I'm taking about four or five in a, a day. Yeah. And I'm telling the doctor like I'm still in lots of pain. They're like, well, you need to stay ahead of the pain, so take it every three hours or so. So now I'm up to like seven of these things. And then I decided when I was through the energy uh, injury and I rehab myself six months later, I just would stop. And I went through this with withdrawals. Yeah. I didn't even know it was withdrawals. Until I, what I happened was I started, I got all the side effects, right? Snivels, shakes, caught hot, cold, sweat. night tears? Yeah. Yeah. All that Real shit. Real bad. Real bad, yeah, right? Yeah. And and I just thought all of a sudden when I, that, that day, I'll never forget that day, I thought that all of a sudden I got the flu really bad. Yeah. And I remember, you know, toughing it out the first night and just feeling miserable the next day. And then I was like, fuck, I just need to sleep. And I still had some of the Norcos in, in my cabinet. I take one and whoa. Yeah. I felt amazing. I felt like I could go out and go lift, and I was it caught rid of all this. And, and at that moment, I went, "Holy fuck!" Yeah. Like my body has become dependent on this opiate, yeah. and that's when I started diving in, researching this and that. So, what was that like for you? It was a slippery slope, and it was uh, again. I never really thought anything of it because I wasn't just taking them for fun, right? I had like, "Hey, I have the surgery. The doctor, the approving authority, is telling me this is what I need to do." part of my recovery process. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it. Uh, and yeah, there was a lot of pain for sure. And then these little happy pills make it all better. Right. And then, like you said, you know, every couple hours turns into, well, I need, I need it sooner. Um, and again, my doctor says it's okay. So therefore it must be okay. And so just started recognizing that, uh, I'm having to take more and more to get the same effect. And you guys all know, and anyone listening who studies, you know, exercise science and stuff, you know, your body will begin to downregulate these receptors for for pain because you're flooding it in with all these other things that are doing its job for it. And the body just wants to stay efficient. And, you know, it's a lazy piece of shit, I think, but the most efficient <laughs> lazy piece of shit. But um, it, it's just, it's so easy. And so you start taking more and you start feeling better for a while and then it slips up. And so then you don't want to feel the pain again. So it's just one thing feeds another. And so literally for about three, four months, I just started with Percocet and Vicodin and hydromorphone, fentanyl patches. Like you even even gave out literal candy, like these happy pills. It was uh, fentanyl pops, like suckers that w- that were these. God, damn, and, that's creepy. Yeah, that's fucked up. Yeah, yeah, because like so God, many people have damn. like, oh, I can't take a pill or here's a lollipop. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and so it um it became easy, and so therefore you know who wants to do the hard work when it comes to pain management, right? Right. Um, and then, but I tell you, man, after that incident where I was like, 
I'm feeling a little bit more extra pain, like you said, mm -hmm. and I want to go take some more pills, but I'm totally useless, so I need to go lie down. Uh, I wound up, I took the pills. I'll never forget this day. I took a couple extra of the medication. Um, I started getting loopy. Uh, I don't really remember going to bed, but I remember waking up with uh, my girlfriend at the time, hovering over top of me. I was like prisoner in my own body. I wanted, looking back, I had a seizure, a uh, uh, grand mall, I think it is, mm. where I was like semi-conscious, but I couldn't move my body. I was inhaling, but I wasn't exhaling. My chest was just concaving. I couldn't move. I was like rigid, tense, oh, freezing shit. up. Uh, uh, what it Terrifying. Happened, absolutely. Like cold, I was drenched. I swear to God, I thought someone dumped a bucket of water on me. Uh, what had happened was uh, the medication kicked in. I didn't quite make it to bed, apparently. I wound up hitting, falling down, completely knocking myself unconscious. Pretty bad head wound off the corner of the table. Wow. Uh, gave myself the mild TBI I was talking about. Really bad concussion. Mixed on top of probably three doses already that time of uh, pain meds. Not a good place to be. So the seizure induced, I wound up next thing you know, I woke up, I was in the ER and uh, they're like, yeah, this is uh, this is what happens when you're on three to four months of pain medication. Wow. Yeah. Shit. Wow. Now, what, how was it like coming off of all that? I mean, did they, were, you, you, did, were you in did you rehab or were you in the hospital? Like, what did you have to do? So I was in the hospital, I think for barely 24 hours. They kind of, you know, monitored me, gave me some more pain meds. Uh, of course, they had to check my hips out because a fall, I was like two, three weeks after surgery, could have messed up, you know, the mm -hmm. pins and stuff. So I got clear. They sent me home and they began to immediately downregulate my medication. So I recognize. And again, I think this is where I think I have a strong suit and recognizing where like Chase, this is good versus Chase. You need to stop doing this kind of thing. Like I have pretty good awareness. I feel like I've always had a good sense of that. So I, I just had to suck it up, man. I had to embrace the suck. Like I always say uh, what the military always just tells us, just embrace the suck and drive on. So they downregulated my pain meds and I just had to deal with it a little bit more because I was like, I don't want to wind up back in the hospital. You know, anytime you have a seizure, you know, they revoke your license. So I went a few months without being able to drive uh, and it just, it, it sucked. But I just realized that the pain now is better than what could happen if I go back to previous right. habits. Do you remember how long it took you to completely wing off and, and, and be fine? I was on some form of pain pill. I would say for probably about six to eight months, um, whether it was just like tramadol or like super high level horse pill, uh, Tylenol or Advil mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, yeah for a long time. And then I even started venturing out. And this is where I really started learning more about uh, the human body and stuff and put me on the path where I am now was I was looking at acupuncture and dry needling and um, prolotherapy, which is something I never heard of, which honestly sucked even more than I think the- uh, What is the that? I've never heard of that yeah, before. So prolotherapy is, it's, I imagine it kind of like dry needling where basically they, uh, they numb up the area of pain around. Uh, so you just get a shit ton of the little bee sting pricks to numb it. Uh, and then they take a really, really long needle, really thin, uh, and basically the point is, hey, if your joints, your muscles, your tendons, everything are having severe inflammation, long-term pain, because your body's not recognizing this pain receptor or for whatever reason, it's missing this inflammation marker. So we're going to go in. We're just going to Induce agitate. inflammation. Exactly. So they would just like literally like, have you ever seen like a liposuction oh, video? That sounds fun. Yeah, they would literally just go in this needle and just like, just go to town. It's similar, to, to, dry, to, town. It's similar to dry needling. Yeah. But uh. at the same time, uh, they would inject this uh, semi-saline solution stuff to... Um, now, is this Western medicine approach or is this an Eastern so this medicine? This was an MD that administered it, but he only practiced Eastern medicine, if that made sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, they're stimulating an immune response or, or a response to heal the body. That was the goal. And I will say- Did it I, work? I gave it like two or three tries. I could recognize the benefit from it, but- the process wasn't worth it to me. <laughs> not, not at all. Not at all. Man, because I would just like bend over. Not drop looking trout. forward to it, huh? <laughs> no, hell no. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? I'll, again, I'll just embrace the suck. I'll deal with it. Yeah, wow. Uh, uh, I appreciate you being able to talk about all these difficult things because there's a lot of people out mm. there who are going through similar issues and it's it's tough to talk about. It's very difficult to talk about, let alone talk about yeah. on a podcast. Um, talk a little bit about the, the PTSD that you experienced. Cause I think it, you know, it's kind of like a buzz term now, right? People hear about all the time, but I feel like I almost went, I, I almost went through a little bit after I had somebody who I lost very close to me, who I watched them deteriorate from cancer. And I identified some symptoms after mm -hmm. that I think were probably PTSD of some sort. What was that like for you? The after effects always amazing, isn't it? Mm. 
hindsight being 2020. Um, no, nobody will fool you better than you will. That's mm-hmm. the thing. Like when you're in something, you're so in it, you don't you're see closing it. Closing yourself, right? This is yeah. where, if for me at least, this is where I find value. And it's very difficult, mm-hmm. very difficult. But this is where I find value in people around me that I trust. Like mm-hmm. I trust, there's people around me that I trust so much that they can tell me, you know, hey, Sal, you're something's off. You're acting like an asshole or whatever. And even though I wholeheartedly disagree, that I trust them so much that I'll say, okay, I'm wrong. They're right. You'll objectively yeah. look at it. Yeah, I'm wrong and, and they're right. I don't see it right now, but I trust this person. When you were in it, did, did anybody help you with that or how did you identify it? So when I was in it, it was a little bit more obvious because I was it was literally happening. I was around friends, around family, and it kind of made sense, you know, like it's the immediate grieving process. Mm. So of course people are going to be emotional or whatever, but I had to quickly suppress it. And this is one of the things I talked about why I think people, the immediate first inkling that you have about, am I questioning mortality? Am I just suppressing feelings? If you think you need mental help, go see a mental health therapist immediately. Uh, Don't wait 10 years like I did. Um, I had to go back to the military. So I had to immediately suppress those feelings and emotions. Now, could I have sought help sooner? Sure, yeah. I mean, they have therapists, they have doctors that could help us out. And I did see them for a short period, but I went back to having to be a soldier. I went back to not having to let my emotions and feelings sacrifice the integrity of this mission or Mm -hmm. my job or leading others or whatever. You masked it, right? Exactly, yeah. I had to mask it. Yeah, shout out Lewis House. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, But so... For the next six years, you know, I, I, I use the excuse, I did use the excuse of, I don't have time to deal with this right now. And so it would pop up its ugly head from time to time. Like I said, I- What would it look like when it would pop up? So the biggest trigger for me was just seeing anyone in a hospital, hmm. like particularly in a hospital bed, hmm. because how my father's illness progressed so quickly, every time I would come back home, which I would try to take three day, four day weekends, every month or so, every time I came back, he was worse and worse and worse. And his last three months of his life, he was in a hospital bed. And so, you know, the body likes to kind of just suppress things. And so anytime I would think of my dad, um, I I had a hard time kind of just going back to that spot. But when I saw it, it immediately took me back. I would see a movie, a TV show. I, I couldn't even walk into a hospital because I would, I would break down. I would freeze up and seeing that, I immediately took me back to the day that he passed away. I, luckily, I was able to get some emergency leave, and I was home my, my father's last 30 days. Uh, and I was with him his last almost 48 hours. He was alive. But then walking into the room and seeing your hero, your best friend, seeing this person that you literally watched die, which is wither away day after day, month after month, I, it, it would immediately come flooding back. And I would just become terrified. I would become emotionally unstable. I would just laugh, cry, freeze, shake, have anxiety attacks, just, you know, and I would just completely lose track of where I was. And so people would have to snap me out of it. Uh, or even sometimes when I was driving, if I would hear somebody talk about a, a similar story, I would have to pull over uh, because I just became unsafe behind the wheel. And it would just immediate flashbacks, you know, and the, you know PTSD, I don't have an exact definition, but it's like when something triggers a previous experience, it's not just that a current experience that you process. You feel it's, the old one. Exactly. You're back there. Right. You're back in the mm-hmm. shit. And so that's what it was. And so it wasn't just like recognizing this bad illness that someone else may be going through, but it was me every time walking back in and seeing my father, seeing my family around him crying, seeing just this this person that I grew up with for 19, 20 years, just com- be completely unrecognizable. Mm. Um, ALS, just you, you atrophy everywhere. The mind stays sharp. It doesn't affect the mind at all, which is think why I, it's so cruel. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you're a prisoner of your own body. Yeah. Mm. How yeah. many people do you think suffer from some sort of a PTSD and, and it just expresses itself differently in different people? Do you think there's a lot more than people realize? I think a lot more than people realize. Yeah. Because if, I agree. Yeah. If, if you're not able to separate this bad experience that's going on right now from what you went through, then I think that's PTSD popping up a little bit, you know, in, in any mild way, shape or form. Um, if what is happening is not what is happening, it's you reliving it and not really being able to fully process that. And honestly, even consciously separate yourself, get yourself out of that. What makes it more difficult is the fear 
of the experience. Yes. Not more so than the experience itself. I, I'm so afraid of feeling that again, or I'm so afraid of. That's why I said I would avoid hospitals. Right. Yeah, I, I would. I wouldn't watch. Um, TV show I wouldn't like Scrubs like yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know that's a little bit funnier sometimes yeah. so I, you know House Grey's Anatomy oh, yeah, yeah. like any movie I would go to a movie and if there was like a hospital scene I would have to get up and leave they're doing yeah. are you looking at some of the re, uh, the research that they're doing with PTSD the and uh, yeah psy- psilocybin and MDMA and some of these other no, compounds but I could kind of maybe understand whether they're trying to like induce that same experience to better walk you through it or like what's, what's the science so thing? it's pretty fascinating actually they're so uh, you know, obviously these are these are Schedule One or Two drugs, highly illegal. But the people who are actually putting the funding behind a lot of these studies, believe it or not, is the military because we've now had you know some long running uh, you know occupations, wars, and so we're getting a lot of soldiers coming back with PTSD, and so they're actually investing money in figuring out better ways of doing therapy with some of these uh, individuals. And they're finding that like MDMA, which is the popular drug in you know ecstasy or Molly or whatever, or okay. psilocybin, which is magic mushrooms, they're finding that you know one or two sessions with those substances is equivalent to years worth of therapy. Really? Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually um, Maps, which I know that's our fitness program, but there's actually an organization called Maps that studies this, called the um, or that it's an organization around the study of these substances it's called the Multidisciplinary Association of psychedelic studies and it's all scientific it's all science based wow. and uh they're finding remarkable results um i i'm very much into that uh into learning about that because i think it's absolutely fascinating i think there's a future in therapy but my best interpretation of what they're studying or what they're finding is that under the influence of certain substances it uh gives you the empathy uh, it gives it puts you in a state where you're so empathetic to your own situation that you you lose the fear of going into not that you, not that it doesn't hurt yeah right because yeah. here's the thing like when you have a something traumatic happen to you whether it's a long something that happens over a long course of a, you know a long period of time or happens you know one instant when something traumatic happens to you uh, your mind and your body remembers that feeling. And you become so afraid of both that thing happening again, but more so the feeling of what how you felt when that thing happened. You become yeah. so afraid of it that you uh, it's another layer on top of whatever happened, and it imprints. It almost imprints in your body, 100%. in your mind. And what prevents us from processing that is the fear of it. And so I think what these substances do is – they make they give people enough empathy, or at least they, they create this feeling of empathy where they like, okay, I'm going to go into this. I can talk about this. It's, I'm not so afraid to process this at the moment because I feel different than I normally do. So let me talk about this thing, and then they process it, and they truly process it. Versus, you know, if you ever go to therapy for a traumatic experience, it can take years before you even talk mm-hmm. about the experience. Mm-hmm. You know, people don't realize, people say, well, why does therapy take so long? Well, it took me three years just to talk about, you know, the time I was abused. Like I, I couldn't even talk about it for three years. So um, fascinating. It, it expresses itself in different ways too. Yes. As a, yes. That's what's that's what's tough about it. I think there's not like this common like, oh, you have PTSD, so you notice these symptoms. It's like you could be suffering from something totally different. I dealt with it as a uh, eight year old, seven to eight years old after my dad committed suicide, and we had no idea. Like we did, I had, and I didn't even know what it was. I all of a sudden at mm. seven years old, I began shitting my pants. Out of nowhere. I mean, potty trained my whole life, never fucking had any problems with that. All of a sudden, I would I would not go to the bathroom and I would hold it. Mm. And I remember getting the shit beat out of me for for shitting my pants and being potty trained mm. by my and mom. You didn't, you didn't want to do this. Fuck no. Yeah. yeah. No. This, this no, you're happens. old enough to know. Yeah, yeah. You know how embarrassing that is? Yeah. Extremely embarrassing. And then being a kid who's going over to a friend's house, it would happen. And I would try and hide mm. hide my underwear and do, doing all that. And meanwhile, you know, I'm an eight year old kid, seven, eight year old kid. And it's just adding another layer on Yeah, I don't, I'm not processing it. Even yeah. my mom's not processing it. She She's fucking screaming at me, yelling at me because I'm. What are you doing? You know, she's, she's got enough to worry it. about. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Yeah. So you know, you don't you don't realize. It wasn't until years of therapy and stuff later on of that coming out that they they actually attribute that to my hmm. my dad's death and hmm. each one yeah. of the siblings and people did it handled it in different ways. So that's the scary part yeah. is you don't. Sometimes people don't even realize the way I look at it with these situations, at least. Uh, and for me, uh, is you know obviously we're in the we're in the uh, the field we communicate right that's what podcasters do yeah we're communicating to people, and I feel like going through these things, 
as difficult as they are and as challenged as they are, and, and like we said, we look back and look at them as gifts, it uh, gives us, at least for me, it makes me more empathetic. So mm-hmm. now I can, I'll sit down and listen and feel what someone may be feeling mm-hmm. when they're trying to communicate something, which makes me far more effective as a communicator myself, far more right. effective at my job. Do you find that? And that right there, I was just going to say that's, you know, I definitely find that. And, you know, what you're talking about, I think, is what should be to the very core of what an effective coach is, uh, whether you're a personal trainer, um, a coach, a health coach, a life coach, whatever. You know, it's becoming empathetic and recognizing that a lot of times what people are talking about is not really what they're talking about. And the fact that, like you just said, Sal, you know, we, go to therapy sometimes and don't ever talk about, or not for a long time, talk about what you really need to be talking about. And it's because of the fear. I mean, who wants to just be afraid all the time? Who wants to just stay uncomfortable? But it's only in that fear. It's only in getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Are you ever going to progress? Are you ever going to truly, what I believe, get to the core of why you're there with a therapist, why you're there with a personal trainer, why you're there with a coach? You have to get through that shit. I, I, so, uh, I just a couple years ago went through a divorce, right? I was married for 15 years and I have two children, very difficult time. And something that helped me was uh, a quote or a phrase that I've heard several times before, but I never really understood it. And it's the, uh, it goes like this. The only way out is through, through. right? Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. I, I've heard that before. It didn't make any sense. The obstacle is the way. And I thought to myself, and I said, and so what I did is I actually pictured, I actually envisioned what my challenges were, and it looked like hell. Like I'm standing in front of fire and lava and just hell, and I can't get to the other side except walk through it. There's no, there is no other path. I can't go above it. I can't go around it. I have to literally walk through hell. But if I don't walk through hell, I'm going to be standing in front of it for the rest of my life. And so you just got to find the courage to walk through that. Embrace the suck. And embra- <laughs> embrace, embrace the suck. Embrace the suck. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so fucking true and it sucks. It sucks because you got to go through it. I mean, and, you know, of course, if there was a way we couldn't. Um, but then again, again, would you be who you are? And it's yeah. funny because we're all, we work in fitness and I know you work in, in, you know, self-improvement and in fitness. Uh, your, that's what your podcast is about. And, you know, it's, we work, when you're dealing with, you know, obese, you know, obesity, people who are overweight or people who aren't taking care of themselves, uh, when I first became a trainer, I remember thinking to myself, like, God, why doesn't this person just stop like eating <laughs> shitty? Like, it's so fucking easy. Stop eating it's shitty. Like math, right? Just start, do it. Just yeah. do it. <laughs> just start walking, yeah. uh-huh. start working out, stop eating shitty, and then it's done. It's not that hard. It's not that big of a deal. Like, fucking just do it. But what I didn't truly understand, what I didn't truly empathize was- Psychological piece. That, yeah. w- that whatever they're going through, the obesity, the health issues, the lack of mobility, the- you know, issues with their appearance, all that stuff. Just an expression of something going on deep down. That pain, yes. that pain is less than whatever pain they're running from. Exactly. Right? It's literally, you know, they say how alcohol and drugs aren't the solution. They actually are for that for that particular individual. That is the solution. Now, it's not a great solution, but to them, it's better than it's an escape. It's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It helps them disconnect. So I just, uh, I just, so I have a friend who I just talked to yesterday. I just, uh, I totally forgot about this. I want to bring this up. You have a friend? Yeah, okay. I have a friend. That's it. <laughs> We're done. No, I, I, had, <laughs> I have a friend that works in retail and she has this boss who um, is just a dick. He's a dickhead and he's really obese, uh, like severely, like 100 pounds overweight. Mm. Always just an asshole. Well, I guess he went and got gastric bypass to lose weight. And everybody was like, okay, well, maybe he's going to be, you know, a better guy. And, you know, yeah. this is going to totally solve Chill him out issues. A bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, he did the gastric bypass, has over the course of, you know, a few months or whatever afterwards, lost 100 pounds and comes to work and, with a bottle of what looks like water, but is vodka Oof. and is now drinking at work and is no different than they were before, except that they're lighter. And it's just highlighting what we're talking about. Like, there's something there. Mm-hmm. That they're not addressing, and that was just eating food was just that was their solution for that. Food is safe. Alcohol is safe, or maybe not safe is the right word, but it's it's safer it's comforting. or safer. comforting. Yeah, exactly. It's the easy way out. It's the way that I can just endure this thing without actually having to endure this thing. And this is one of the the biggest things that I, I walk people through when I'm coaching them, whether it's 
going through a life obstacle or they're significantly overweight is that they talk about all these things, right? Or like, oh, well, I, I couldn't work out because of this or, you know, I overate because of this reason. Well, you most likely know all these things. So when people present all of these obstacles and fears, I'm like, you are literally giving yourself the answers to your own test. You are describing what you know is before you. There's no surprise. There's no sudden left turn. You know exactly what you need to do. You know exactly how to study. You Life is giving you your answers ahead of time. And we're just, we're too afraid to pay attention. We're too scared. We're too whatever because there's an easier way out. You know, you, you, you can stare directly into your own hell. And most of the time, most of the time, you can see through it and you can see what that life looks like on the other side. You can see what a life 100 less pounds looks like. You can see what life on the other side of a breakup mm -hmm. can look like. But you know what? There's this barrier in front of it. So now, nah, fuck it. I'm not going to do that. You know, yeah, I, can, I don't I know, dude. I think a lot of people have a hard time seeing through it. I think a lot of people... Well, they uh, fool themselves. Yeah, they're yeah. not seeing they through do. the stories we tell ourselves, man. Right, the right. We, we, get, tell we get so we get so caught up with what's in front of us that you can't see beyond that at all, and that's what justifies those means. I mean, I think uh, to a certain extent, we all uh, suffer from this or gravitate towards something that makes us uh, less present and disconnect. And that could be it. Could go. It could. We, we've talked about drugs, alcohol, but it could be as simple as scrolling on Instagram and, and, oh, and yeah. searching mm -hmm. for dopamine rushes to get likes and friends and scroll hit, scroll hit, right, scroll hit, scroll right. hit. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily have to. And, and I think so when you get caught up in it, you don't even realize it. And I think a lot of us, I mean, I catch myself still and I'm like, well, what am I detaching from right now that I, I got in a lot of times? Cause I have something I need to be doing. I should yeah. be doing this. I need to be doing that. I don't really want to do that. So I do something that just totally numbs my mind yeah. <laughs> and that could be smoking cannabis. That could be drinking something that could be popping pills that could be scrolling up and down on social media. All and day. you know, man, that's exactly what I think a big part of what I was talking about before and sharing that this kind of dark origin of ever forward was that. I was able to latch on to this brand, this meaning, this, this, this purpose of how I show up every day because that was my mask. That was my easy way through. It was so easy to just be like, oh yeah, cool. Like people like what I'm doing. People like what I'm saying. So I can just, I can just keep doing that. But I, I wasn't being honest with myself. I was using this thing as the mask in front of my own hell. Mm. And I was using that as a way to not deal with what I really needed to deal with. And that was looking back at this situation, what happened to me physically, what happened to me mentally, emotionally, and this loss, and I wasn't recognizing the gift in it all. And so I was doing this thing, but it, it wasn't with true purpose and intent and meaning. It, it was my mask, but it was just so easy because it, it was this positive, positive mask, right? It was this cool thing that me and my family, my brother were all doing. And uh, I was just, you know, I was able to put that affront up. And like I said, the last this last one to two years, especially since um, uh, I got married, my wife, she's amazing. She calls me out all my shit all the time. I, <laughs> she will always know me better than myself. Um, you know, she has helped me through this. My working with my coach and being honest with her in this process has dramatically increased my business and my professional development and my fitness and just how I show up every day. Um, it, it, even in something that's seemingly positive, you know, maybe not becoming an alcoholic, maybe not putting on a hundred extra pounds, you know, you can not deal with things in positive ways too, seemingly positive. Right. That's yeah. how people get addicted to exercise. Right. Oh, <laughs> that's oh yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. Uh, favorite guests that you've had so far on your show. I know you're only a year in, but you've had quite uh, a few guests, right? Yeah. I've been fortunate enough to have some amazing people on. I got to say, I always love connecting with Josh Trent. I know you guys have had him on oh, yeah. for us. Yeah. He's a such fucking a, great he's guy. A great interviewer yeah. too. He, great interviewer, great interviewee. I yeah. mean, him and I, I think we're cut from the same cloth and uh, he and a few other people who podcast are the one of the big reasons why I got into it because I was like, you know what? I, love, I like what you're doing. I can fucking do it. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and, you know, I just tried to do it and I, and I did it. So Josh was amazing. Um, and honestly, I actually had on... My wife, which I think was really cool, we did a. Oh, you interviewed a, your wife. We did a couples Q and A. We still need to yeah. do that. We, oh, everyone wow. keeps asking us to bring. Oh my the, god, I get I get on. asked that. Are you nervous to do that? Day. Or is that something you're like, <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, you know, yes and no, because even if it's um, if it makes me look good or makes me kind of look not so good, like she'll 
she'll shoot it to you straight. And so some of the questions we got were kind of like, <laughs> she sounds a lot like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Straight so I mean, shooter. she was brutal honesty. Exactly. Yeah. Straight shooter for now, sure. Do your downloads reflect your favorites or do you, did you have one that, do you have certain episodes that just did way better download wise compared to others? I definitely think th those two particularly correlate for sure. Yeah. Uh, one of my higher downloaded ones. Um, one of the ones that got the most downloads was <laughs> Justin, if you're listening to this, man, I'm going to give you a shout out. One of my, my sort of kind of coworkers, he is a chiropractor by trade, but he works in their deep tissue myofascial release therapy company. Mm. And um, we talked about, which I thought was going to be tricky about, you know, low back pain, but we really talked about not just about it, but treatment and stuff like that, which is hard to do, I think, in the podcast format. You know, I think video is better for that to sure. walk people through. But um, yeah, that was one of the surprising ones. So I think that just goes to show that, Topic, like we were talking about before with topic doesn't always equate to great success in a YouTube video or a podcast download. It's that, you know, how visually does it look or how does it sound? Is this professional great? Or uh, with him and I, we just have a great rapport. So I think people connected with that looking back on it. But at the same time, it's a great topic. Did you did you find uh, Mind Pump before Josh Trent or after? When, when did you first come across us? I, I found you guys through Wellness Force. Mm. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good uh, looking ahead in the future, what's, what do you guys got planned? What are your, what are your goals in the future? Man. So taking over the world. Cool. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We're going to have to fight over that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. We put our stake in. Yeah. Too, right. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, let me rephrase that. I want to take over the world with all of you with me. There we go. I want I like all that. of us to just keep doing what we know is our truth to keep doing what we're meant to be doing. And for you guys, that's calling bullshit and that's sharing your experiences. I mean, I love your format. I love how you have Justin, Sal, Adam, three totally different lives who came together at a unique point for a reason. And you guys, here you are, man. You're talking your truth. You're sharing what works, what doesn't. And so many people connect with that. And I, one of my greatest gifts that I've realized is that I'm really, really good at connecting with people who are way more successful than me. And, and that comes in a lot of different forms. You know, people who are physically stronger, you know, I'm in the quote unquote fitness industry. Well, you know what? I, I stand right next to people who out deadlift me all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, my brother and a lot of other people. Say like, Henry Ford. You got a healthy it, ego, man. Exactly. And, and I love that though. I love connecting with people who are just in their prime, in their shit, doing what they love to be doing. Mm -hmm. I feed off of that. Mm -hmm. I, I think drive is one of the most contagious things in the world. And looking back a few years ago, I was kind of dicking around. I was like, I kind of want to do this, kind of want to do that. don't really know. But the more and more I became involved with people who had their shit together, knew what they wanted to do, it helps me. And so, you know, whether it's I'm working out with people who are 10 times stronger than me, being this, having this incredible opportunity coming on Mind Pump, uh, guys who are more successful on paper, quote unquote, you know, maybe in the podcast world or when I do a YouTube collab with people who just have hundreds of thousands of subscribers and I'm sitting at like barely 19. So uh, it, that doesn't really bother me because every time I engage with you guys or someone else of that mindset, uh, I, it, it, it just ignites a fire under my ass. And so I want us all to just keep doing our thing and I want to be a part of everybody's success and I want to help out in any way, shape or form because I know if you succeed, I succeed. It's oh, a great attitude. You're, you're, yeah. you're echoing what we talk yeah. about all the time. Echo. Are you getting some it. feedback? Echo. echo, echo. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming on the show, brother. Yeah, guys, yeah. I, I, it's been a privilege and honor. You know, Justin, Sal, Adam, thank you guys so much. Um, you know, the second you guys are like, yeah, come on out. I was like, I'll fucking do it. I'll book my flight. <laughs> so like, don't, don't just be polite with me here. Yeah. But um, you know, I want to say I, I really find value in, in your truth. I find value in what you share and, you know, your raw fitness truth, what you guys share was honestly a, a big kind of catalyst, whether I recognize it or not at the time of, you know, sharing my truth. And I, I, I want to just hope, I want to hope that this helps other people live their truth, speak their truth, or even just take a step back and think, you know, what am I, what am I not facing? Right. Are you mm -hmm. being honest with mm -hmm. yourself? Exactly. Yeah. So you guys keep killing it. It's going to help me keep killing it. And, uh, ever forward brothers. Right Appreciate yeah. it, brother. Uh, check out YouTube, mind pump TV, we post new videos all the time. In fact, I think after this podcast, we may go film a YouTube video, uh, with you, Chase, Chase, let's if you're do down. it. I got my camera. Let's roll. Excellent. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. 
Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.